bum 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 I have some bullets. I I I just have like a thousand links open. So let's let's do this. Uh, my my note taking strategy you would find terrifying. Uh, just terrifying. I'm David Torcivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment. And if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. David, we've talked a lot on this show about uh, climate change, environmental destruction. I'm thinking episode 70, Thinner Ice, episode 50, Apocalypse Now, where we talk about the latest IPCC report. And the lies that it contains. <laughs> the lies that it contains and what it means for the future of humanity. Going way back, episode 34, Irreplaceable, on the way that climate change is destroying habitats and, and diversity of species all over the world. And as you would expect, Many people uh, want to do something about that, right? We want to hold our politicians accountable. We want to hold our companies accountable, right? That makes sense. These are the, the people and the organizations that have the most power in our world and therefore have the greatest potential to change. Daniel, I don't want to just hold them accountable. I want them to actually stop doing what they're doing and fix these problems. But I guess we have to start somewhere. Um. Lucky for you, David, some companies are doing something. As you, oh, yeah, as you may know, it was Earth Day a couple days ago. Mm -hmm. Yay, Earth. And the CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, he tweeted I think his uh, name is Tim Apple, actually. <laughs> Tim Apple, in support of Earth Day, uh, he tweeted out pictures of nature uh, and he made sure everyone knew that they were shot with an iPhone. Uh, the company also celebrated Earth Day by making the leaf on the Apple logo green for the day. And also in celebration of Earth Day, uh, they challenged all the owners of an iWatch to complete a 30-minute workout challenge. Um, well, they weren't the only people I saw celebrating Earth Day on Twitter. Uh, the Democratic Party were trying to let everybody know that they were the party of environmentalism by changing their little blue D to a green D. Uh, it's a really beautiful tweet. Uh, made me tear up. Inspiring. I think a bunch of trees bloomed when it saw it. Yeah. If you check out our Instagram, Ashes Ashes Cast, you can actually see this. Uh, but I think we should also note at the same time that while the Democrats are in favor of, you know, publishing this green D as their support of the earth. Uh, when it comes to actual green policy, like the Green New Deal, well, that just isn't realistic or possible. Sorry. Which I think is kind of the theme of the show today, isn't it, Daniel? That's right. And we're talking all things green today and on Ashes Ashes. And specifically the way companies acknowledge the need that we have to preserve the environment while doing absolutely nothing about it. At least nothing substantial. Or more specifically, what they claim to do about it, which is uh, maybe on the face of it sounds good, but in reality is not doing anything or even making it worse. I think this episode in particular is such a good topic for this show because it really brings together so many things that we've talked about. Like you mentioned, all these climate change episodes where we see just how dramatic the future that is in store for us is, what it could be if we don't do something about it. And at the same time, all this manipulative advertising and behavior changing that we see as part of our greater culture, that is because of the way that we interact with business, because of the way that we're treated as consumers, all these things have come together and form this beautiful synthesis of green products. This thing that didn't exist until a few years ago, maybe a couple decades back, where you as a consumer can continue to act the same way that you already have, consuming things, buying stuff, growing the economy, but doing so in a responsible and green way. Or at least that's the pitch. So Daniel, do you maybe want to take us back a little bit, uh, maybe to the beginning of Earth Day, uh, the history of this environmental movement, and show us how we got, I guess, to this point right now, where we consider, for whatever reason, making substantial green change, nothing more than tweeting out these nature photos. Great idea, David. I want to take everyone on a short trip down history lane. 
um, to really flesh out the premise of this show, which is that climate change and in this, this environmental destruction that we want to solve, doing something about that, the real solutions to that are in complete opposition to the current dominant economic ideology that all of our, our companies and our politicians are oriented around. Right? We saw the moment the world scientists started ringing the alarm bells in the late 80s about climate change and the seriousness of it. That was the same moment this new world order of globalized free market capitalism dawned, where we saw the formation of the World Trade Organization, a myriad of international free trade deals, all aimed at maximizing the freedom for corporations to exploit labor as cheaply as possible, sell products for the highest profit possible that are free of regulations, and avoid paying taxes which were made up for by public sector spending cuts. All this allowed corporations to freely pollute, uh, emit, emit greenhouse gases with no consequences. And so tracing this history alongside the development of the green movement is really illuminating to the place that we are in today. And I want to start out with an example from Texas. There's a bird species there known as the Atwater prairie chicken. It's native to the great state of Texas. It's actually quite beautiful. If you Google this bird, they have this, these bright yellow air sacs uh, on their face. It's quite adorable. But they're one of the most endangered birds of North America. And during the 20th century, rapid development in Texas fragmented the habitats of this Atwater prairie chicken, which reduced their population from the millions to the hundreds by just the late 60s. And one of the few remaining breeding grounds for these chickens happened to be located on a property owned by ExxonMobil in Galveston, Texas. But fortunately, in 1995, ExxonMobil donated the property to the Nature Conservancy, a deal that both organizations made for the stated purpose of saving this chicken from going extinct. And if you know anything about the Nature Conservancy, it is a large international organization that dedicates its mission to preserving land and wildlife habitats and, above all, combating climate change and environmental destruction. But David, a curious thing happened just a few years after uh, this partnership between the Nature Conservancy and ExxonMobil. Uh, I knew this was coming. <laughs> it's never just a nice story about a cute chicken. There's always something else. We can never just let the chickens be, right? Never. So in 1999, this great international organization dedicated to land conservancy uh, started quietly drilling for oil <laughs> on this uh, Atwater Prairie Chicken reserve, uh, Preserve. And they started drilling in the exact spot where these prairie chickens nested and made it. Uh, at one point, they were constructing a pipeline and there was a delay in the construction. So the Conservancy decided that they would delay the introduction of some new Atwater chicks by three months so they could get this pipeline do uh, done. And so by the time they released them, it was kind of out of season and they all died, unsurprisingly. Oh my God. Um, and uh, all this was exposed around 2003 when just 50 prairie chickens were thought to still exist anywhere. And as a result, a lot of me media attention was directed at the Nature Conservancy. They stopped this oil drilling. Uh, the president of the organization actually made a public apology and said, quote, we won't initiate any new oil, gas drilling, or mining on preserves that we own. We thought we should, for appearances sake, not do that again. <laughs> Jeez. Um, but then five years later, they picked it back up again. And Naomi Klein writes about this in her book, This Changes Everything. And I want to just read an excerpt from this book on this topic. Quote, in November 2012, and with little fanfare, the last of the Atwater's prairie chickens disappeared from the preserve. The preserve manager said of the birds that there are none that we know about. It is worth underlying this detail. Under the stewardship of what media describes as the biggest environmental non-governmental organization in the world, boasting over 1 million members and assets of roughly $6 billion and operating in 35 countries, an endangered species has been completely wiped out from one of its last remaining breeding grounds on which the organization earned millions drilling for and pumping oil and gas. Amazingly, the website for the Texas City Prairie Preserve continues to boast that the 
quote, land management techniques the Conservancy utilizes at the preserve are best practices that we export to other preserves. <clears throat> David, I actually checked the website for this preserve and I didn't see that specific quote. But it does now say that, quote, over the years, Texas City Prairie Preserve has become a region-wide model for native prairie restoration, native seed growing, and the benefits of natural infrastructure. And I would just like to point out that in 2018, the wild population of this bird dipped down to just 12 individuals worldwide. And today, there are maybe a couple hundred of them after a recent release by the Houston Zoo. Well, uh... I mean, that, that is a hell of a story right there. I, I've got all these greenwashing examples, but they're from, you know, the typical uh, companies you would expect to do this sort of evil stuff. But like nothing that I have is going to top this ridiculous greenwashing from the Nature Conservancy, like the people who are supposed to be the good guys. If we can't even trust a, an organization that literally exists to protect nature to do just that when they see the chance of this profit in front of them. Then, then what hope do we have with the rest of this stuff? I'm, I know it's only, we're like five minutes into the show and I'm already ready to jump off the cliff here, but damn. <laughs> and, and we'll get to maybe why this is, but Naomi Klein goes on to write in her book about how these groups are often receiving large donations from energy companies. They have executives from energy companies that sit on their boards, et cetera. Conservation International, for instance, has partnered with Walmart, mining companies, multiple oil and gas companies in the past. These things I already knew and expected. It, you know, it's pretty common to see nonprofit boards stacked with executives from the same types of corporations you'd expect them to be adversaries of. But what was surprising to me is that many conservation organizations use part of the endowment money they have, right? The money that they raise uh, to invest in the stocks of energy corporations. In 2013, the Nature Conservancy had $22.8 million invested with oil and gas companies. Uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society had a $377 million endowment in 2012, of which an unspecified portion was invested in energy, mining, oil drilling, and agricultural businesses. The Ocean Conservancy had $14 million invested in public stocks in 2012, of which over $500 million was in energy, $150 million was in utilities, and $130 million was in materials. I'm so tired, Daniel. <laughs> Everything is so exhausting. These, these stats. Uh, I'm sorry, David. <laughs> uh, what a what a world. Keep going. Keep going. Let's hear more. <sighs> well, look. Look, I, I know this is kind of painting a bleak picture of, of these massive conservancy groups. And this is not to say that they don't do a lot of good. I mean, that prairie preserve in Galveston is, is like 2,200 acres. Sure, maybe they shouldn't have been drilling on it, but I suppose preserving that land in the way that they did is at least better than just allowing ExxonMobil to completely drill it. All right, I guess. I guess I can hand them that. A lot of this conversation here reminds me of the things that we talked about in our episode on philanthropy and specifically philanthrocapitalism, where these organizations, because of the ways that we decided to shift funding around or that uh, we feel like conservancy or philanthropy or, or charity shouldn't be something that can exist solely through donations, that they have to be self-sustainable, I guess, at some point, which is why they have all these giant endowments. Right. Uh, and if, if you're trying to maximize your endowment, I guess they are trying to balance these lesser two evils. Like, is it better to profit off all this stuff and invest it in something, uh, quote unquote, good? Or is it better to uh, try and be ethically pure? And uh, just move along on the good graces of the people who support your cause. Right. And uh, the obviously the overwhelming market ideology that we have right now has really pushed this capitalism side of philanthropic capitalism, uh, which is why we see these enormous amounts of hypocritical investments and actions that are going on right now. Uh, but it's it sort of bums me out, you know. Yeah. Well, I think you're getting you're hitting on a, an important point, David, because. Again, it sounds like I'm making these groups out to be evil or something, but they're not. You know, a lot of people that would work for something like the Nature Conservancy want to do good, want to preserve things. And I've volunteered with nonprofits down here in Atlanta where the people that work there, they acknowledge the contradiction of trying to do some specific work that's, you know, supposed to strengthen communities and then look at who sits on their board, right? They understand that. But the the whole point is that 
you know, going back to the premise of this show, as long as the dominant ideology of world power is free market, global capitalistic accumulation, that's the structure that these organizations find themselves stuck in. And yes, they could be better, but at the same time, they're faced with the difficult choice of being more responsible and losing their revenue from corporate donors or, you know, fall in line, get paid and do the best you can. And the history of environmentalism in the West is something that Naomi Klein goes a little bit into in her book. And it's one in which we had Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which many of you are, are aware of about the dangers of DDT and pesticide use. And the alarm surrounding that, as well as the depleting ozone layer, really radicalized and mobilized a huge group of the Western population who demanded action you know, for us to do something about all this environmental destruction. Yeah, it, it, it turns out people really don't like having acid rain or polluted rivers or air that they can't breathe. Who would have thought? <laughs> Who would have thought? And so the people demanded direct action to challenge all this wild west of pollution. And it resulted in what could be considered the golden age of environmentalism here in the West and in the United States. There were 23 federal environmental acts passed into law in the 1970s alone. And from this era came so many of the regulations that we're familiar with today, including the Air Quality Act, the Water Quality Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Superfund Act, which requires companies to clean up the toxic waste that they've dumped on land. So many of these acts came within just a couple years of this public outcry. But then, David, this is where the story changes. This is where the table <laughs> turned because... It always happens. This prompted the full force of reactionary capital, which rushed back against this new environmental movement, and a new free market global order was ushered in, during which environmental regulation was attacked in part as, you know, being a Trojan horse for evil communism or for Nazism in disguise. And we saw the establishment of a new economic framework becoming fully entrenched at the highest levels of power in which freedom for corporations to act unhindered in the pursuit of profit became the only sensible goal. You had people like Milton Friedman coming out with persuasive ideological arguments about how if you want what's best for society, let corporations be greedy, and in their pursuit of profit, they will satisfy the needs of society, right? Uh, another way to put it, as Richard Smith writes from the Institute for Policy Research and Development in London, the 70s environmental movement represented ideals of anti-growth, whereas this reactionary response by advocates of so-called green capitalism was that profit growth could be aligned with environmental goals through such things as technology, green labeling, and eco-friendly shopping by consumers such that, in the words of business leader Paul Hawken, quote, restoring the environment and making money can become one in the same process. Uh, uh, I want to interrupt you just for a second here, Daniel, because again, I'm seeing echoes in other things that we've talked about in this show, uh, particularly this denial that we have to change anything in our behavior, because if we just alter slight portions of what we consume, or the technology that, that is powering all of this, then we can continue living this unsustainable life. And we see that especially playing out in the conversations that are happening now, as we talked about in episode 21, Klima Ex Machina, about the geoengineering that is being talked about right now to dramatically alter the Earth and its atmosphere and the environment in order to allow us to continue business as usual and suck some of this carbon out of the air without disrupting the ecosystems or the overall environment too much, uh, most of which we find out in that episode are nothing more than pipe dreams or so ridiculous that they're not uh, possible or have such incredible uh, side effects that it could oftentimes make the problem worse than it was before. Uh, but that mindset that if we just do this magic technology thing, if we make these products in a different way, if we use this technology to suck carbon out of the air, well, then we don't have to change our behavior. We can continue to consume and grow indefinitely. And that is good for business. Right. And, and what all this new thinking meant for the green movement was that funding for those old school radical groups who wanted to do something about climate change and destruction by taking corporations head on, well, that funding dried up. 
while green groups who were willing to adopt the new market-friendly language, they got all the money. And their message became one of collaboration and partnership with corporations to find market-based solutions to environmental destruction. The oil drilling done by the Nature Conservancy and that, uh, that we talked about earlier is a prime example of this. And a few days ago, at the same time that Tim Cook sent that tweet out that we mentioned in the beginning of the show, Apple reminded us of their partnership with Conservation International that they have on a mangrove tree preservation in Colombia. This is all problematic because the existence of these big green groups purportedly dedicated to protecting the environment and fighting climate change, who we've all been sending money to and placing our faith in, they've undermined the ability for large social movements to form. Because many people simply assume these groups are taking care of it. Most of the conversations around climate change since the 80s, in fact, has been largely steered by people from the upper classes of elite society. We're talking about corporate CEOs, presidents of corporate aligned conservancy groups, U.S. vice presidents. These are the people who have been leading the discussion on solutions to these problems. And as Klein points out in her book, much of this discussion has in fact been employed to direct Americans to simply consume more, which is really the heart of the problem, as we've talked about, just consume more in a different direction. Uh, Here's one more excerpt uh, from her. Quote, These various approaches also served to reinforce the very extrinsic values that we now know are the greatest psychological barriers to climate action, from worship of wealth and fame for their own sake, to the idea that change is something that is handed down from above by our betters, rather than something we demand for ourselves. They may even have played a role in weakening public belief in the reality of human-caused climate change. Indeed, because the solutions to climate change proposed by many green groups in this period were so borderline frivolous, many people concluded that the groups must have been exaggerating the scale of the problem. After all, if climate change really was as dire as Al Gore argued, wouldn't the environmental movement be asking the public to do more than switch brands of cleaning liquid, occasionally walk to work, and send more money? Wouldn't they be trying to shut down the fossil fuel companies? No, Daniel. All our problems can absolutely be solved by switching our brands of deodorant. And uh, anybody who tells you otherwise is a liar being paid off by big green energy. Big green energy. Okay, once again, Daniel, we have gotten pretty deep down this rabbit hole. You've given us a little bit of history back round. But, I mean, most of us... That is in the past. A lot of our listeners, we weren't even alive during this process. Uh, The 70s seems so long ago. Uh, They figured out the chlorofluorocarbon problem, so problem solved, right? Uh, But we do encounter this greenwashing today, absolutely. Every time you walk to the store, you go to Target, you go to Walmart, you go to your bodega, you see all of this product that's marketed as green. And this is our personal experience with what we're talking about today, this greenwashing campaign. Uh, You watch, and it's, it's so completely infiltrated every aspect of our life from our commercials uh from the vehicles that we travel around in uh, even the way that people talk the candidates that are talking about things right now in the run-up to these primaries a year from now and i still can't believe we're having to talk about this yet all that aside i mean greenwashing is a huge part of our life green products are everywhere but unfortunately as we continue to find out much of the time the green in these green products isn't actually environmentally green but just more money And they're taking advantage of the fact that we do care. You know, we do care about the environment. And that is something that could be, if twisted, very profitable. So let's look at some of these examples of companies committing greenwashing sins, uh, taking advantage of the consumer want to do good, and how the fact that, you know, in general, the idea that being able to purchase things as a way to solve problems just doesn't really work all that well. So uh, I want to start this with something called the uh, sins of greenwashing. So that we can establish this baseline uh, seven point proclamation of like, these are the problems that we encounter when products either lie or are misleading or whatever, and they make them not actually green. 
So uh, there's actually an organization, uh, they call themselves the Sins of Greenwashing, that wrote this, but other uh, journalists and uh, academics have taken these concepts and written more extensively on it. You can find some of those journal papers on our website, ashesashes.org. But I just want to summarize from this website and read some of these sins here, because once you start thinking about this stuff in terms of these basic guidelines, you can see very quickly how little stuff actually is green. So are you ready? Um, I'm ready, but I did Google. I had to Google bodega. Bodega. That's what we call like delis or corner stores. Yeah. I had no idea. I was thinking that it would be something completely different. No. And I guess the bodega term is, is relatively recent. It was only like a small part of New York. And then I guess a decade ago, it started shifting. And, and now everybody, because there's so many of us transplants here, we all just refer to it as bodega so that we can feel cool. Uh, Yeah, David, I'm ready for, uh, hit me with uh, some examples. Okay. Name and shame, as we like to say. Name and and shame. Well, let's figure out what we're shaming people for before we start naming them. The first sin is the sin of the hidden trade-off. So what this is doing is, is basically claiming that an item is green by paying attention to a very narrow portion of what the product is. So like, imagine you have green paper. Paper in general is absolutely not environmentally friendly. You have to mulch a bunch of trees. It's an energy intensive. It's a process. There's lots of chemicals involved. It's not a green thing. Mm -hmm. But by saying, oh, you know, this is from a sustainably harvested forest, then we can claim our product is green, even though, you know, the product's not. (laughs) It will never be green. It's just less bad. So that's the sin of the hidden trade-off. Another example might be the electric vehicle, right? We hear a lot about that. Oh, we'll get to that. Don't worry. Yeah, but something like 50, over 50% of all the emissions that is emitted by a vehicle is actually done in the manufacturing and producing process. Mm -hmm. Of of any vehicle, and it's even more for EVs, but yeah. So there you go. So in that case, it might actually be more environmentally friendly to drive that used car that you have that's an old clunker than it would be to trash that and purchase a brand new electric vehicle. Don't worry. We'll get to this this example in depth uh, very shortly. Sorry, Elon Musk, we're coming for you. But to continue with these sins, the second sin is the sin of no proof. And this is basically where they'll post something on the product or talk about on their website that makes some sort of claim, uh, like it has a certain percentage of recycled content. Um, but then there's no actual proof that this is the case. And oftentimes these companies do just flat out lie because there are, in many cases, no consequences for doing that. And it's a very simple way to make something look green or to phrase things in misleading ways so people assume something, but really the opposite is the case. So that's sin of no proof. It's very similar to that is the sin of vagueness, which is when that you make a claim that you so poorly word or define that it could mean absolutely anything. And oftentimes when products are marketed as all natural, this is exactly that because there are plenty of things that are natural, but are terrible for you. Uranium arsenic, mercury. These are all naturally occurring natural products. They could be in the products that you are consuming, killing you, but it's still all natural. So they use these sorts of phrases on top of things to make you think that they're good, when in many cases, it's just a lazier way to do that. And we've talked a little bit about this, um, how organic, you know, we have this idea that something's organic, it's good innately, uh, it doesn't use pesticides or whatever, but oftentimes use these natural pesticides that are way more toxic for you and for the environment that it's in, thus defeating the purpose of this process. Same type of thing. Again, related to this is the sin of worshiping false labels. And oftentimes uh, you see this, especially with bottled water or like fabric softeners or stuff, where there's this implication that this is from like a sustainable place. Oftentimes you'll see like designs of beautiful nature and pristine lakes and rivers and and maybe an allusion to some sort of body that guarantees all this stuff is natural and fresh. But generally, there's nothing hard or concrete in that language. Lawyers have carefully poured over this and made sure nothing is actually guaranteed does, in this. Does a green leaf on the Apple logo count as green labeling? Exactly. So this would be a sin of worshiping false labels. If that green leaf suggested for something, or or you might see a badge that just says like certified and it doesn't say who it's certified by or what that means. Or oftentimes like like maybe a couple of leaves will be in a corner and it and it'll just have like green leaves and like a badge and a star on it. And you're just supposed to assume that, oh yeah, this has been certified by some organization that this is a green product, but that organization doesn't exist. Uh, We're just supposed to lean on this packaging design to make you think that it does and make you that much more likely to select it in the store 
when you're purchasing something, whatever it is. The sin of irrelevance is when there's a claim made that is oftentimes true, but doesn't actually matter. Hang on. There's a motorcycle idling outside my, my door. Did you, see, did you see that movie with Will Smith where he has superpowers and he's like a, like he's like a regular Joe homeless person, but he also has superpowers? Uh, Hancock? That might have been it, yeah. I, I, all I remember vaguely is a superhero movie that with Will Smith and it sucked. No, it was absolutely terrible. But one of the main characters was this guy who like he worked for a PR company that was trying to convince companies to use their... Uh, they're like healthy label or something like you know they had a little label that if they could convince companies to use it would show that their companies are green or something like that anyway you were supposed to feel bad for him because he was like trying to do the right thing by getting companies to reform their things and then you know they didn't take him seriously they laughed at him but then he helped out will smith and like uh you know will smith was super grateful so he flew to the moon and painted this pr logo on the bright side of the moon so that the whole world could see it. And it was like supposed to be like heartwarming or something. That sounds terrible. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess that would be a false label, uh, but like a really evil one. Um, okay. Sin of irrelevance. This is when you put something on the label that sounds good, but is oftentimes required to be there by law. So like if you put on a product claiming that there are no CFCs, no chlorofluorocarbons or, or it's mercury free or whatever. Um, that's awesome. But also, it has to be free of CFCs by law. You're just putting this on there to sound like you're being good, but like everything is CFC free. So it's a way to, to, to distract people and to say, oh, this product has no CFCs. That's great. I don't really know what those are, but I know they're bad for me because they're not all natural. So that brings us to the last two, the sin of lesser of two evils. You'll see this a lot in products that are really bad. So like, say I want to buy a new car and I want to buy a crossover or sport utility vehicle. Obviously, those aren't great vehicles for the environment. They pollute a lot more. They're not super fuel efficient. But look, there's a new one that is environmentally marketed. Uh, they will plant trees for me if I purchase this. Uh, it has slightly higher fuel efficiency. So I'm going to buy this product instead of the more polluting one. Well, great. Congratulations. You, d- you bought something that is still bad, but is less bad. So that's the sin of lesser of two evils. Of course, it's kind of like the Shell Company. They have an advertisement on YouTube where they show this like young couple. I think they're lesbian. So, you know, it's also like promoting, hey, we, we accept all people. And the couple is like converting their home to like solar energy and they're doing all these things and they're talking about how they want to convert to simple living to protect the earth. And then uh, the Shell Company zooms in on their oven when they cook something. It's like, and to do that, we're helping them with natural gas. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess natural gas is better than like burning diesel in the middle of your house, but it's still not ideal and you're you're absolutely still polluting. Actually, that probably combines a couple uh, of these sins in a single ad. And oftentimes that's the case. It's not just one of these. Usually it's several. Uh, The last sin and the greatest sin and the one that we actually see oftentimes is the sin of fibbing. And this is when you just straight up lie. This we see a lot, especially in electronic products. If you've ever purchased a new refrigerator or air conditioner or something, and you see that Energy Star uh, rating on it that says this product is more efficient or less efficient than others, oftentimes these companies just straight up lie on this. And those tests, the Energy Star ratings are self-administered. There is very little consequences if you fake that. Uh, LG actually just, uh, they recently had a bunch of their fridges that they lied about their efficiency. Many times they would use it as much as twice the electricity that they claimed it would. And uh, the consequence for that, well, they had to send a letter to their consumers letting them know that they lied. But they didn't say lie. They said, we performed things with slightly different specifications in our test than we were supposed to. So that your energy rating is actually higher in real world use than we thought initially. Sorry, it's not actually Energy Star certified. And that is the sin of fibbing. And that brings me to one of my favorite recent greenwashing controversies, which is Volkswagen. Maybe you heard about this in the news, Daniel, with their diesel cars. But uh, in Europe, especially where diesel is much more popular than in the United States, Volkswagen was marketing their products, their, their diesel vehicles, as clean diesel. Because as clean diesel, hang on, there's someone honking every time I say clean diesel. It's Volkswagen outside. As clean diesel. God, no, truck came by. <laughs> Volkswagen's trying to silence me okay. as clean diesel. And I mean, diesel is more fuel efficient than regular gasoline. 
but the big problem with it over time was that diesel was polluting more in this process. It released more particulate matter. Uh, some of the nitrous oxide, these other fumes that were coming off of it were more problematic to the local air pollution. So uh, it was discouraged, but modern diesel engines are much more efficient in eliminating all this extra stuff. So uh, it's gotten cleaner and you made a big push to try and adopt diesel as the primary fuel of choice because uh, these, these mileage requirements for the fleets were so stringent that it was a great way for them to meet that while waiting for electric vehicle technology to mature a little bit more because honestly, it's still quite not ready for prime time. But uh, all that aside, so uh, Volkswagen though was having trouble getting their diesel engines to perform correctly in terms of both mileage as well as these pollution standards. And so they came up with a strategy, a very small group of people within the company decided that the way to get around this was they were going to install a little chip on their overall computer control for each of these engines that would detect when these engines and these vehicles were being tested for fuel efficiency and for um, emissions. Interesting. So, you, you, Hold on. so you're saying they installed a chip that would know when a person was about to test for the emissions so that it could like maybe adjust the way the engine uh, outputs to trick the emission computer? That is exactly what happened so uh, we all that that's so uh that's so like uh evil genuinely like brilliant evil thinking right there i know right it's a move fast break regulation sort of mindset that i think has slipped over from silicon valley that's innovation at its finest it's disruption daniel and i mean we're all familiar with emissions tests your vehicle you have to get it tested every few years to make sure it's not polluting and so these cars... Or at least not polluting... Too much. ...over a certain threshold, yeah. Exactly. Thank you. That's an important distinction. Um, so the, these cars would detect when they were being tested for emissions and alter the way the engine would run in, in a way that is not great for driving, but it is great for these tests. So they would pass their emission tests, and then as soon as they were disconnected from the computers, it would go back to that more polluting, more fuel-intensive uh, program for the engine. Well, eventually they were busted for this. People figured it out. Uh, some people went to jail. There were huge fines posted. Uh, Volkswagen is now installing enormous electric charging networks as part of their penance for this, this process, spending billions of dollars to do that. But uh, this whole time, remember, they were marketing this as a cleaner product, as clean diesel, greener than the alternatives. And this is such a great example of some of the greenwashing that we see today, where a company is saying one thing and really doing another. Mm -hmm. I guess from your seven sins or, or however many sins it was of greenwashing, David, that would be the sin of fibbing, uh, the sin of mislabeling, and you know, probably, probably another sin. Just throw another sin in there too. You can probably link all those sins in there at some point. But you know, Daniel, it doesn't just end with these uh, fossil fuel burning cars, you know, these problems of greenwashing also extend into electric cars, which I think we all like to look at as these bastions of what is green and good and environmentally friendly. But uh, paradoxically, that's oftentimes not the case. Like you mentioned earlier in this episode, building a car is very energy intensive. It uses a lot of energy. It takes a lot of uh, transportation. Uh, there's a lot of mining that goes into it. It's complicated. Honestly, the fact that we can build any of these cars and, and buy them as affordably as they are is nothing short of a miracle. Modern car companies are really just masters of supply chains and assembly that happen to also make cars. But that aside, uh, electric vehicles are more complex in this process than traditional vehicles because the construction of the battery pack requires a lot of energy and a lot of uh, rare earth elements that are hard to get out, that require extra shipping from all places around the world, oftentimes in uh, controversial places like in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we turn to for a lot of the cobalt, much of which is mined by children, uh, child slaves, things like that. That uh, ethical concerns aside, this is a very energy intensive thing. And the production of an electric vehicle, especially one that has 200, 240, 300 miles of range, uses a huge amount of energy. And off the lot, an electric vehicle is already far more polluting than a regular vehicle. Of course, as the regular vehicle drives, consumes fossil fuels, this sort of balances out. And to be fair, compared to a regular gasoline burning vehicle uh, with an average amount of, of highway mileage per gallon, over the course of the life of the electric vehicle, even if it's being charged by uh, polluting coal burning plants, you're probably going to come out more efficient 
than the traditional internal combustion engine car. So that's fair. You know, this is a better alternative to what we have. But a fully electric vehicle or BEV, battery electric vehicle, like we see as produced by Tesla, is a worse choice than a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, which is a sort of mesh between the two. So uh, take a look at a vehicle like the Chevy Bolt, which has a small battery pack that drives it maybe 70 miles. And then a basically what is a generator, a gas powered engine in it that will charge the battery pack and provide power to the rest of the car should the battery be emptied and allows you to drive indefinitely that way, refueling at traditional gas stations. Well, because this battery pack for this car is smaller and because the car overall is lighter, because these battery packs again are very heavy, the lifetime vehicle emission outputs of this partially gasoline burning car is actually much less than this fully electric vehicle. So paradoxically, what we think as the greenest possible choice, this battery powered, fully electric thing that never touches any fossil fuel, at least initially, though down the supply chain, admittedly it does. Well, you know, that is a worse choice for the earth than a car that burns some gasoline. Because most of our day-to-day driving is short distances. You charge overnight. We don't do these oftentimes long trips that do require 200 miles or 300 miles of battery capacity. But that's not how they're sold. They're sold as a mission to save the earth. You know, a lot of the Tesla fans will go on about how they're changing the earth. They're saving the earth from uh, environmental catastrophe that Elon Musk is a hero for doing this. He's not. He's just a guy who found a way to sell cars to suckers, to rich people. And you mentioned earlier too, Daniel... There's no reason. Every time you buy a new car, you're doing far, far, far more worse for the environment than you would be just continuing to drive the same car. Right. Because the production of that new vehicle is really bad. So these economic incentives that the government has put down, that we put down for purchasing these new vehicles uh, or, or leasing even worse vehicles and constantly moving to a new one every three years, two years, five years, whatever. These are much worse than continuing to drive the same, even slightly polluting vehicle. So what we're doing in this greenwashing campaign is taking rich people who are already polluting more than everybody else. We're giving them economic incentives in the forms of typically tax credits for EV purchases to buy new vehicles, which are polluting more in that process of being a new vehicle instead of driving the same old ones. And then uh, because they're for electric vehicles, targeting it at these things that are worse than these partially hybrid electric vehicles, which admittedly do get the tax credit, but the tax credits should be greater for these middling vehicles instead of the fully electric ones. Um, and these tax credits should also be encouraging the consumption of cheaper electric vehicles instead of these more expensive ones, which is again rewarding these people who are polluting more from the first case. And uh, what, what we've done and what, what these subsidies have done is encouraged and reinforced this idea that these products, which are really honestly bad for the earth, are good. We've distorted the market. And then even further, we've messed it up with the marketing that occurs through willful ignorance. And then also just the misinterpretation of what these basic numbers are. And that's, that's a common theme in a lot of this greenwashing, which is to say, it's important to remember, you know, these are general guidelines to remind yourself to think about, don't just take these claims at their face value. And if you do that, then you really start uh, getting somewhere with this process. But some of these companies are really catching on to this and putting on this guise of being open and transparent and still screwing around with this. So there's another specific form of greenwashing. They call it green stitching. If you're talking about greenwashing in the fashion industry, maybe you're familiar with a company called Everlane. They call themselves a radically transparent clothing company uh, that is sustainable and environmentally responsible. If you go to their website, they have all sorts of information about the clothes you're buying. You can see the factories that they come from, allegedly. You can see, you know, the process, like their pricing, like, oh, it costs this much to make it. It costs this much to ship it. This is the profit that we're adding on. And this is the final price you pay. And the idea is that, like, look, we're radically open. This is transparent. And that they use that word radically very liberally. Um, look, we're so progressive as a company. We're trying to be responsible in this process, uh, buy our clothes. And they're using this as a marketing pitch. This is, this is how they decided to set themselves apart from other companies and to give you the consumer compelling reason to purchase their clothes as opposed to something else, especially when they're putting themselves against these fast fashion brands that we've talked about extensively in the show in our episode, Fashion Victims, which is an incredibly polluting, uh, incredibly wasteful industry. And it absolutely is. Mm -hmm. But Everlane is still committing a lot of these sins in this process. So while some of their stuff may be produced in these sustainable, responsible factories, they oftentimes don't talk at all 
about where they get the raw materials and the products that eventually make these final produced clothes. So a lot of their fibers are not from sustainable supply chains or the supply chains aren't certified as such. They use lots of synthetics like nylon, which come from oil. So already they're producing things that aren't sustainable, things that are polluting. But because it's farther down the supply chain, even though they're being open about the later parts of it, they can wash their hands of that sin and pretend it never happened. And that's what so much of our modern day greenwashing does is look at this part, focus on where I want you to see, where we've cleaned up and made a very polished green image, but ignore the rest of the stuff. That doesn't matter. And we see that idea carried continuously, not just in products, but in the way that companies themselves, cities, nations conduct themselves in a green manner. We've talked about how Germany or many of these European countries claim that they're very green in the way that they treat trash, but that's because they sell their garbage they can't recycle to China originally, but now Malaysia, now Thailand um, as exports. They can count it not as, as, as trash. They could say, oh, this is an export. We're getting rid of it. Yeah. And then it ends up in the ocean or it ends up in dumps and it ends up destroying the environment over there. But it's no longer Germany's or Switzerland's or Sweden's or Finland's problem. And they can pretend that they're meeting all these mandatory regulatory things they've set down and be green. That's greenwashing, but on a national industrial scale. Yeah. Speaking of industrial scale, it reminds me of episode 58, Renewable Problems, where we talk about green technology, solar power, wind power, and how a lot of uh, utility companies take advantage of these international funds that have been set up to finance uh, these wind parks around the world or whatever. Ultimately, what they do is they design profitable energy initiatives in, say, like southern Mexico. They'll plan a wind park, but then they'll grossly exaggerate their costs so that they can get this climate funding. Then once the project is implemented, not only are they making a profit, but they've qualified for carbon credit so that they can go right back to their home country and pollute just as much, if not more than before. Meanwhile, touting in their PR copy of all this green uh, technology that they're investing in. Exactly. And we find this pattern over and over and over again. And it's nothing new. I mean, I can keep going on about Everlane, but I, I don't, I don't want to get too sunk down in one single company because everybody is so guilty about this. So looking just at one small section of one small market group, natural and environmentally friendly products that are available on U.S. supermarket shelves. This is just a great example of how rampant this problem is, even just on a consumer level, ignoring all these larger uh, nation state things that you mentioned. 98% of these items that call themselves natural or green or environmentally friendly, 98% of them available on these supermarket shelves are making some kind of lie. And they aren't actually what they claim. That means almost every single thing you buy that claims to be green is not in some way. Where is this coming from? A testimony made to Congress about this problem uh, from a man named Scott Case as part of an environmental consulting firm called Terra Choice. And there's a huge variety of reasons that this happens. There's a variety of ways that it happens, as we talked about with these sins. Um, a lot of them are lies. Uh, we've talked about these, these fake badges that are put on something. 22% of these products that make these claims have a badge that actually isn't a, a meaningful badge. It's just a, a, you know, like a leaf with a star on it, but it, there's no organization behind that. And then an even bigger problem is a lot of these environmental certification programs are just random people who are like, okay, yeah, we'll start up a thing and we'll rubber stamp your product as green. And we don't care to actually do any due diligence on it. We just trust you with what you say. Uh, and there are, at this time when this article was written, which was a decade ago, this article is from 2009, there were 300 of these organizations around to offer some sort of environmental certification of your product. It, the problem has only gotten worse as the number of green products has exploded because consumers prefer to shop green. We know we're destroying the earth. So if we feel like we can alleviate some of that guilt by changing our shopping habits a little bit, paying a couple of cents more, then people tend to do that. And that is a great profit incentive for these companies to act in bad ways. Yeah, I think that's such a great example of how the way this this green movement has been wedded to the need for profit accumulation has really just encouraged more consumption by us the consumer and it's kind of you know clearly something's not working when we're trying to save the planet and yet the number of things that we're producing and consuming the emissions that we're emitting the pollution that we're putting into the oceans 
the number of habitats we're destroying, all of these are trending up. So something has not been working. And so I want to talk a little bit about this. Why it's not just that these companies haven't figured out the correct way, right, to offer products while still remaining green. It's it's not a an issue of we just haven't innovated the correct solution yet, but we're working on it. We just need more money and research development. That's not the problem. The problem is that fundamentally the 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 core goal of environmental stewardship is completely incompatible with the current economic structure, right? And and so we see all these goals that are presented in this market language of just consume these goods and we'll save the earth, uh, invest in this technology and we'll save the earth, so on and so on. And on a broader scale, we see uh, solutions being offered like on the governmental or international level, such as green taxes, green bonds, uh, the cap and trade system that was implemented by the European Union. And I want to just hone in on these real quick, because these are kind of the big like conceptual solutions that a lot of people point to as like, look, uh, companies who pollute are bad, therefore let's tax them. So let me hone in on green taxes for a second, because on the face of it, it seems like a good idea, right? The idea being that corporations make money from the production and sale of goods. But they do not necessarily have to pay for the cost that we incur dealing with the pollution and destruction that results from that production. So therefore, let's figure out how much damage is done by, let's say, an agricultural company that dumps pesticides everywhere. Let's come up with a dollar figure and then tax them based on the cost of that damage. And in so doing, we'll de-incentivize them from doing that action or, or maybe they'll have to innovate around it, right? But the, the problem with all this is that so long as profit accumulation is the premise of the economy, these taxes will always fall short. Just consider the coal industry. The IPCC's latest report urges humanity to rapidly cut emissions over the next few years, or else a two degree warming is going to practically destroy life as we know it on this planet. And so, any appropriate green taxing that we implement would necessarily have to make the coal, oil, and gas companies so unprofitable that they effectively go bankrupt and disappear. In other words, these taxes would have to result in industrial degrowth. Unsurprisingly, no such taxes exist, and they will never exist, because this would cause widespread unemployment and lead to economic depression, and the current economy has no tolerance for that. Just like the housing market crash of 2008 was a surprise to mortgage companies, whose uh, prediction models literally could not be configured to assume declining housing values. The models our economy is based on has no answers for mass unemployment that results from constricting because it has been set up to assume that the one and only solution for unemployment is more growth. So no politician would implement an anti-growth tax policy under that framework. And David, if, if you'll bear with me, if I can just rant a little bit more on this, I feel like I need to drill down a bit because we have this reactionary narrative that, that's going on, and I think it spooks a lot of people, that says, well, hold up now. If you interfere with markets or you try to give people basic necessities directly as, a, as opposed to letting the free hand of the market provide those, then your naivete will result in economic collapse. There will be no jobs, and everyone will end up in the street eating rats. And I want to reiterate, a scenario in which an oil company goes bankrupt and leaves thousands of people without a job, that is a problem only in this crazy economy where everyone must compete and fend for themselves. We've created this problem. Think about what it means to have an economy of infinite growth. What does it actually mean to pursue infinite financial growth? Ultimately, it has meant and will continue to mean taking whole chunks of things and breaking them apart into vulnerable and liquid pieces. What, so what do I mean? Let me give you an example, a visualization, if you will, an illustration. Okay. Let's say I'm a factory owner and I have a problem. I only have one factory. And if I were to keep growing, I need two factories. But labor is too expensive. I can't afford it, right? So one weekend, I decide to get out of the city and drive around the countryside for some fresh air. And what do I see? I see a whole village of people living off the land, feeding each other with their gardens and their chickens, their cows. And all of a sudden it hits me. 
These people aren't contributing to the economy. Who do they think they are? Just, just living, enjoying their lives, growing food for their own consumption, right? This is a huge problem. So I rush off to the state capitol where I schedule a meeting with the governor and I say, Governor, those lazy country bums aren't contributing to our economy. We need to raise the property taxes on their land so that they have to give back to the economy. And if we do that, I'll be more inclined to contribute to your re-election campaign, right? So that's what we do. We raise property taxes for rural villages across the state, which these people cannot afford to pay. So they are forced to conform to the market economy. A small percentage of them might stay on the land where they convert to industrial farmers, but the majority have no choice but to migrate to the city looking for work. That community chunk has been broken apart into individual families and people that I, as this factory owner, can now employ as cheap labor. My wealth grows, and so does GDP. That's growth. So fast forward a few years, David, and now I own five factories. And you, being the environmental hippie that you are, (laughs) you are unhappy with all the pollution that's in your drinking water, and you've identified my factories as the source of the problem. So you start a campaign to shut them down. But I defeat you because I can say, look at how many people I employ. If you shut down my factories, all these people will be out of work. This is the narrative we're stuck on today. It's what's blocking direct challenge to these companies. But it's if you look at my example, David, it's very obvious that this problem is contrived. It's not a natural law that people become vulnerable unless economies grow. It's completely the other way around. Economies grow precisely because we have made people vulnerable. Growth is achieved in the modern economy by breaking things apart in every realm imaginable. You take a diverse forest with countless interdependent species and you break it down into simple two by fours for sale as a material commodity. You take a union, which is a chunk of workers who use their collective voice to protect wages in addition to other things, and you break that apart. You start surveilling everyone. You fire anyone who is too talkative, all so that you can lower wages and slash benefits, which grows profits, grows GDP. You you take a tenants' right organization, a chunk of tenants working together to keep rents affordable, and you break them apart so you can raise the rent. Now those tenants can't afford rent, just like the villages who can't afford land taxes. They can be atomized even further into cogs for the gig economy. They're driving for Uber now. They're doing freelance programming. On and on. And finally, as these chunks get smaller and smaller, we see that the individual herself is seen as the final frontier, this chunk to be broken down into parts. As car companies seek to track our driving habits, insurance companies want to know how often we drink water, phone apps log our sleep patterns, smartwatches track our location history, facial recognition cameras track our eyeballs as we walk down the aisles of grocery stores, and every part of our lives is turned into a tinier and tinier bit. And that is the engine of growth in our economy. Daniel, you are preaching to me right now and uh, these are things that we keep talking about let me step off my soapbox now yeah let me step on uh these are things (laughs) we keep talking about in this show we have created a world that is so unbelievably incompatible with sustainable life with happiness with living a healthy wholesome life and and then we wonder why we have all these problems why we're all depressed why we're committing suicide why the world is literally burning around us and and we try and bolt on these solutions that are fundamentally incompatible with the way that we've chosen to organize everything. Car bul- busting out music next to me. You ever notice the cars that bump music really loud always bump really bad music? It's never good stuff. It's that, uh, it's that beep song. You know that, that uh, beep song? What? You don't know that song? You know, like we've talked about here, nothing is profitable because we're borrowing from the environment, we're borrowing from our future, we're borrowing, extracting wealth from the suffering of others, like you so eloquently put. This is a economy. This is a global system of organization and utilization of the material resources that exist on this earth and the labor that we can all put into things built around endless growth, built around continuously exploiting these things in new and evolved ways that generate this GDP. That you're talking about. But of course, 
Of course, a system that is dependent on all this will never be green. But the only way that we've learned to relate to the world is through this consumption. And so when we as individuals are looking at this world burning around us and we say, well, what can we do? We turn to our politicians who have continuously failed us. They say, oh, you know, there's not much we can do. This is not actually a problem at all. They gaslight us for decades. And eventually when they do start saying, okay, yeah, you know, global warming is real. Climate change is a problem. These things in our environment that we're destroying. Yeah, okay, I guess that's bad. But, you know, fixing this is going to be too expensive. A Green New Deal, that's infeasible. Paris Agreement, which is already not enough, as we've talked about on here, that's not possible either. We're going to step out of that because we don't want to hurt the economy. You know, it's interesting. What's interesting? When, uh, when the United States wanted to build a nationwide uh, surveillance apparatus on all of its citizens, uh, it, had the, uh, it found the money for that. Uh, when, when the 2008 market crashed and banks uh, didn't have the money to stay afloat, we somehow found the money for that. Let's see, should I go on? When we want to expand our military uh, so that we're spending you know, more than five times every other country combined, uh, we somehow find the money for that. But you know, global ecological destruction that will leave no future for our children and grandchildren. It's too much. <sighs> yeah, just I don't don't have the money. Well, this is what happens when you have an organization that is fundamentally organized, not around environmental sustainability, but rather the opposite, about the exploitation of the environment. And we can't just bolt on via consumption, being uh, via rather changing the products that we consume slightly, a fix for this, because at its core. This is wholly incompatible. If we want to imagine a better future where we can fix this, it has to be at its very fundamental nature, something that is revolving around the ecological health of the earth. That is not even the remotest sliver of anything that is in the systems that we have right now. And it hasn't been, unfortunately, either in some of the alternative systems that we've seen in the past. The communism of Soviet Russia was hugely environmentally destructive. And there are alternatives happening now, uh, things that are at its very core ecologically centered. We're seeing this uh, occur right now in the revolution that's going on in Rojava with the Kurds in northern Syria. If you're interested in alternatives to the world that we see right now, uh, that's a great place to start reading because it is happening. And it's a disaster right now after they've finally successfully defeated ISIS. They can start turning to rebuilding. Uh, but they are at their core trying to build something that is first and foremost ecologically sustainable, and that is their single greatest guiding tenet. And that means dramatically changing every single part of their life and their environment. Their relationship with each other, their relationship with products, their relationship with the world is being shifted hugely, torn apart, and maybe it was only possible because they had this disaster around them because they're trying to rebuild a war-torn nation that doesn't even exist. These autonomous regions that are just given to them because the Syrian state decided that it's not worth trying to control it. Fortunately, the future they've decided to define is one that is first and foremost about environmental responsibility. And that is the kind of dramatic change that we are going to have to look to if we want to see this because our politicians have abandoned us. The promises that these corporations have made for us are nothing but lies. Greenwashing sins designed to make us feel comfortable, like we're doing something, but at its core are changing nothing. And this is the problem we have when we've been trained our entire lives to interact with the world, to interact with each other, to interact with change and problems that we need to face first and foremost as consumers. The politicians have failed us. So what is our relationship with the greater American economy or Western economy? Well, it's that of consumption. So when we want to do something, it's always a boycott. It's change products. But those don't work because the products oftentimes are lies. The boycotts never end up amounting to anything. The bailouts are always forthcoming when the going gets tough from the government. And we cannot continue to try and fix our future in this process. There is no magical techno fix. There is no consumption fix. We have to fundamentally shift everything if we want to see a future that is any way remotely not a hellscape. But meanwhile, we're given these, these ridiculous market-based means-tested solutions like cap and trade, the most boring, least efficient possible way to try and build some sort of good into the system while not actually rocking the boat. And, and, and these things like carbon credits, cap and trade, is a giant scam industry where these, these carbon uh, credits are priced dramatically less than they should be. We've talked about this before. We might have to do a whole episode just related to climate finance. We absolutely will, because I, this is, it, it is such an enormous scam. And, and 
to the credit of of these climate deniers who say, uh, oh, well, you know, the reason that climate change is being pushed is is to forward this scam that's going on and carbon credits and green grants and stuff. Well, they're sort of right. This is a huge scam. Um, but one, not pushed to deny, you know, climate change or to take advantage of this fake thing, because climate change absolutely, of course, is happening. But uh, to sort of assuage the guilt of everyone to make these uh, policies be met so that everyone can can reach their goals on their whatever treaties they've set uh, and actually not change anything in the process. When we are responsibly actually pricing these credits right, that plane ticket across the country that you can buy right now for $300 should be closer to $2,000. And of course, that destroys the economy. So of course, we don't see it put into action. Well, then, and then cap and trade kind of experiences the same fate as those green taxes, where it seems like a nice idea up front, like, okay, let's cap the uh, amount that an industry can emit. And then if they want to emit more, they have to somehow purchase credit from someone else who has reduced their emissions. But look, this is something that was rolled out in 2005 in the European Union. And immediately, all these industries that would be affected by it started lobbying their politicians to say, look, you know, this is too costly. Like you said, David, since every, you know, nothing is profitable, if you actually try to integrate the cost of polluting into the industries that require pollution just to exist, it doesn't, it doesn't work. They would go out of business. So all these industries just went to their politicians and say, if you don't give me special treatment, if you don't raise the caps to something that I can actually afford, because we live in a globalized economy, we're just going to move to another country. And you know, you'll be left with 200,000 unemployed people in your district and good luck getting elected. And that's exactly what happened. Well, Daniel, I, I want to read another Naomi Klein quote here um, because she really nails down a lot of these concepts, uh, especially on this show. So by posing climate change as a battle between capitalism and the planet, I'm not saying anything that we don't already know. The battle is already underway. But right now, capitalism is winning hands down. It wins every time the need for economic growth is used as the excuse for putting off climate action yet again, or for breaking emission reduction commitments already made. It wins when Greeks are told that their only path out of economic crisis is to open up their beautiful seas to high-risk oil and gas drilling. It wins when Canadians are told our only hope of not ending up like Greece is to allow our boreal forests to be flayed so we can access the semi-solid bitumen from the Alberta tar sands. It wins when a park in Istanbul is slotted for demolition to make way for yet another shopping mall. It wins when parents in Beijing are told that sending their wheezing kids to school in pollution masks decorated to look like cute cartoon characters is an acceptable price for economic progress. It wins every time we accept that we have only bad choices available to us. Austerity or extraction poisoning or poverty. I suppose that brings us to the tail end of this episode, David, and where we ask once again, what can we do? And I think it's pretty clear what we have to do. We have an economic system that is simply incompatible with environmental stewardship. Now, step one, we have to talk about these issues. We, we have to talk about them because as we've alluded to, the green movement, these conservation groups, as, as good as they are, putting our faith in them under the current system is at best delaying the inevitable. At worst, it's actually accelerating it. So people have to know that something must be done. And we have to really emphasize that the current structure cannot solve it, right? And so the only way we're going to solve this is a, is a different way, a better way. I want to quote from Richard Smith, uh, once again, from his paper, where he writes that the problem is our current economy, because it is, quote, perversely in the general interest, in everyone's immediate interest, to do all we can to maximize growth right now, unavoidably, and therefore unavoidably to maximize fossil fuel consumption right now, because practically every job in the country is, in one way or another, dependent upon fossil fuel consumption. And any cutback can only come at the expense of massive layoffs for the humans in the here and now. But since no one is promising new jobs to all these coal miners, oil drillers, gas frackers, power plant operators, farmers and fertilizer manufacturers, loggers and builders, auto builders, truck drivers, airplane builders, airline pilots and crew, 
and the countless other occupations whose jobs would be at risk if fossil fuel use were seriously curtailed. So rational people can understand the science, grasp the implications of the failure to act right now, and still find they have to live in denial to carry on. Given capitalism, they have little choice but to focus on the short term, to prioritize saving their jobs in the here and now, to feed their kids today, and worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. <clears throat> End quote. And this sums it up pretty well, in my opinion, David, because it's easy to say climate change is a big deal and that we need to act now. And we can make fun of those working class people who give in to climate change denialism, but we should ask ourselves do we have an alternative for them? When they lose their jobs, you know, going back to that rant I was on earlier about how financial growth requires atomization of people, the opposite of that is necessarily in building bridges between ourselves and others, building communities, raising class consciousness, supporting bottom up democratic control over resources as opposed to top down billionaire led hierarchies. That is our solution, right? If growth is achieved by atomization, then we must come back together. We must create broad movement and recognize that that's impossible without crossing the identity uh, barriers, without crossing the cultural divides, without crossing the class divides. We need airline pilots to work with truck drivers, to work with computer programmers. Look, we talked about in episode. 63 busy work about how so much of our current economy is just complete bullshit, right? 50% of white collar work is completely bullshit according to the people who do those jobs, that we don't need it. That is an opportunity. As terrible as it is, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to recognize that there's enough work to go around creating a better world. We just have to reshift our priorities. But that will require us as a people to come together socially and culturally, set aside our differences and say, look, we're all exploited. We're all oppressed. We're all the victims of this slow violence where the land that we live on is literally being poisoned and destroyed and we have no future. Let's come together and fight back. Let's take control of the economy. Let's own the resources underneath our feet. Let's spread the work so that we can all work a uh, uh, a 15-hour work week instead of a 40-hour work week, and we can prioritize things that matter like national uh, public transportation, like sustainable agriculture so that we can all escape these food deserts where the only option is processed food that's been shipped halfway around the world. These are things we can achieve. In 1943, 60% of the American population grew victory gardens, and those yields made up 42% of the vegetables that were consumed in that year. We have the ability to come together and and recognize a common cause and fight for it. We're just going to have to do it, David. I don't know how many times on the show we can say we have to break down everything and start over if we want to see some sort of dramatic change. But that's really what we have to do. We have to be honest with each other that buying more things even if they're slightly more green, is not the way to fix these problems. We can't buy our way out of environmental destruction. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. And so the sooner we admit that, the sooner we can encourage these companies not to produce greener products, but just to produce less. And we're not going to find this coming from politicians. We're going to have to do this ourselves. Maybe more than encouraging, but just, you know, collectively make it happen, even if it means some companies go out of business. Exactly. Maybe demanding would be a better word, or forcing, um, I- I- encouraging through uh, means that threaten the, the very survival of the companies, I think is, is what we have to take. And we are seeing more dramatic attacks going on, uh, more dramatic direct actions happening in the environmental space right now. Over the past week, over a thousand people have been arrested in the UK as part of the Extinction Rebellion peaceful protests that are occurring there. And this type of stuff, amping up the volume on the resistance that is happening, is going to have to happen more and more if we want to see a new future that is not, like I said over and over, a hellscape with, at some point, you know, no human life left, probably. Civilization as we know it is in our hands right now. We're the most powerful generation in all of human history. There's no question about it. And we are also probably the last generation that has the time and power to do something about the catastrophes that are coming. 
And if we fail to take advantage of that, then we have failed all of humanity. Here's Naomi Klein one final time. It seems to me that our problem has a lot less to do with the mechanics of solar power than the politics of human power, specifically whether there can be a shift in who wields it, a shift away from corporations and toward communities, which in turn depends on whether or not the great many people who are getting a rotten deal under our current system can build a determined and diverse enough social force to change the balance of power. David, that's a lot to think about. As always, Daniel. But think about it and take action with all this in mind. We hope you will. You can find more about all the topics we talked about, find all our sources, read about the many things we discussed here today, as well as a full transcript of this episode on our website at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, and we will never use ads to support this show. So if you like it, would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, sharing us with a friend, and supporting us on patreon.com slash ashesashescast. We'll send you a sticker, and you can also uh, reach out to us through our email at contact at ashesashes.org. We are also on all your favorite social media networks at Ashes Ashes Cast. Next week, we've got a great show coming up about the resistance that we see to all sorts of things around the world. That's right. It's a history of protest and how that relates to the world right now. We hope you'll tune in for that. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.